rahmatullah wa barakatuh to dearest respected viewers and welcome to a new season of Live in London. Many of you will be coming back from Arba'in for your ziyara and inshallah it will be accepted. Some of you went to Iraq, Syria and Iran. Iran being the home of the burial place of Imam Radha in Mashhad. But how many of us know about Imam Radha's sister, Ma'asum Akum, who is buried in Qum? Who is Ma'asum Akum? Who was her father? Who was her mother? What did she teach us? How did she live her life? And what was the legacy that she left behind? All this will be discussed mm. and more with Dr. Amar Nakshwani. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Very well, thank you, very well. As we will go through the discussion, if you have any questions you'd like to uh, call us on, you can call us on 0203 515 0199 or you can WhatsApp us on the number provided below. Sayyid Amar, how was Karbala? Wallah, alhamdulillah, you know, Karbala was brilliant. Uh, it inshallah, was a great ziyara. ziyara. Thank you, thank you. It was a really uh, great experience as always. Um, you know, it was uh, one full of trials. But these trials were worth it. You know, some members of our group sadly uh, fell down with a virus oh, in wow. the trip. But alhamdulillah, they managed to recover. We were able to see so many people walking to Imam Hussein alayhi salam from different parts of the world, you know, meeting people yeah. from the Philippines and Malaysia, from South America, from wow. parts of Africa and Australia. Mashallah, so from mashallah. everywhere in the world, people had gathered together, a display of love, a display of affection, and um, maintaining their loyalty to the family of the Prophet, peace be upon him. So it was a great experience, alhamdulillah. For those who haven't been, what would you say to them? Would you encourage them or would, you know, what, what would you say to those people who haven't been yet? You know, I don't really need to do much of the encouraging. <laughs> if you look at the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, السلام, they, they tell us, you know, obligatory upon us is of course Hajj yes. to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after that to visit, you know, the graves of the holy saints, beginning with the holy prophet, peace be upon him, his family. Um, and then uh, the great and honorable ziyar of Say the Shuhada. So, you know, the Imams tell us about the great merits, and I'm sure many of the listeners know about these merits. And hopefully, very soon, they'll be able to go and embark on this wonderful journey. Inshallah. So, in terms of Ziyara, a lot of people would have gone to Iraq, some to Syria, some would have gone to Iran, especially Qum. So, a little bit about the Ziyara of Masuma Qum, and maybe a bit on her. Who is she? I mean, a lot of people, including myself, because I've never been to Qum. I don't know much about uh, Sayyidah Ma'asum Al-Qum. Um, who is she? Where did she, where she come from? Why is she buried in Qum? Well, Sayyidah Fatima is her name and you find that she's the daughter of Imam Al-Kadhim Salawatullah wa salamu alayhi, the seventh of the twelve Imams of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa salam. And you're absolutely right, while people have gone on the ziyara of Imam Al-Radha alayhi wa salam in Mashhad, and there are many who, for example, have gone on the ziyar of the other Imams of Ahlul Bayt mm -hmm. Sadly, there are certain figures <coughs> who are neglected, who themselves left a legacy behind for us and were a source of blessings for the people of that particular area. And one of them is Sayyidah Fatima, known as Ma'suma Qum in many circles. Um, she was born in the 173rd year after Hijra. Mm -hmm. And she died in the 201st year after Hijrah. So her lifespan was only 28 years. But when you look at her biography, you find that there are so many pertinent lessons to be learned. At the same time, there is a great amount of knowledge that's left behind. And also there's a lot for us to be able to relate to from her life, which we can easily apply into our lives today, inshallah. Yeah. So... We, all, we know about the Imams and they would always prophesize of great personalities to come. Mm. Um, would Sayyidah Ma'asum Al-Qum, was it the same? Was there any predictions or prophecy of, of such a great lady, honorable lady coming? Interestingly, Imam As-Sadiq alayhi salam discusses the position of Sayyidah Ma'asum years before she is born. Imam As-Sadiq alayhi salam mm. is of course her grandfather. Imam dies in the 148th year after Hijrah. Mm -hmm. We said that Sayyidah Ma'asumah is born in the 173rd year after Hijrah. Mm -hmm. So the Imam in his lifetime tells Imam Al-Kadhim salam his son, that you will have a, one of my children who will be born, they'll die in the land of 
قم. And that one particular child by the name of Fatima will intercede for all of the Shia. Imagine. Wow. So even before she's born, Imam al Sadiq as we said, died 25 years before she was born. Mm -hmm. But he had already spoken to Imam Musa al Kadhim about her birth. And not only spoken about her birth, but also mentioned the fact <coughs> that this lady is so great that she'll be able to intercede for all of the Shia, not just the Shia of her area, mm -hmm. but for all of the Shia. One of the ulama in Qom by the name of Wahidi, he states that in his dream, he had seen Sayyida Ma'suma. And he said to her that, will you be able to intercede for all of the people of Qom? She replied to him, he said, by saying, Next to me, Mirza Qummi, who's buried there, him alone can intercede for all the people of Qum. I will intercede for all of the Shia world. Allah. So this particular dream Allah. of this scholar actually confirms the tradition of Imam al-Sadiq mm. That when Imam al-Sadiq says that she will die in Qum and she will intercede for all of the Shia, this particular dream highlights that it's not just the people of Qum who she's going to intercede for, but rather all of the Shia, those who come from far and wide to come and visit her, mm. all of them she'll be interceding for. Yeah. Oh, sure. So this really confirms the, the grand status of mm. such a lady. Grand status confirmed, but I don't want us to confirm someone's grand status simply because of association. Mm -hmm. We Muslims have this thing where someone's grand because they're the daughter of someone true. or because they're the Very sister true. of someone. Yeah. You see, you mentioned earlier, Sayyid Muhsin, that when people go to visit Sayyida Ma'suma's shrine, there are many who probably hold that shrine and haven't got a clue about the biography of this lady. Yes. They don't know about this lady. They don't know where this lady, uh, where her hadiths are, what knowledge she left behind, which spiritual lessons she left behind. If you ask many of the Shia in the world, why Sayyida Ma'suma great? Many will reply by saying, oh, she's the daughter of Imam Al-Kadhim Or she's the sister of Imam al Rada. When we revere someone, we revere them because of their merit, not their association. Otherwise, Abu Lahab deserves to be given high praise because he's the uncle of the Prophet. Yes. No, being the uncle is not enough. So when Imam al-Sadiq talks of this lady, that shouldn't be enough for us to say, okay, she's a great lady. Imam al-Sadiq also wants us to be able to reflect on her biography. What is it that this lady stood for? You see, when we come and have a show about the biography of Sayyida Ma'suma, <coughs> someone may ask the question, a lady who lived 1,000 and more years ago, why are we looking at her biography in London, for example, today? How does that relate to us? When you dissect the biography of any member of Ahlul Bayt a.s., it's from two angles. The first angle is you want to see when you're going through a period of crisis or trials and tribulations, who could you relate to from Ahlul Bayt where you can learn how to overcome all of these trials, all of these crises and all of these tribulations. Sure. When I'm looking at Sayyidina Ma'asuma alayhi salam's biography, my aim should be that I may go through a period where I lose a loved one in my family. I may go through a period where I'm in a very oppressive government. I may go through a period <coughs> where I want to get married, but I cannot get married. When I'm going through these trials in my life, I look at someone like Sayyidina Ma'asuma and I realize that someone like her has gone through similar trials. Mm -hmm. So the first reason I'm looking at the biography of someone like Sayyidina Ma'asuma, my aim is to try and make sure that whatever she went through in her life, I'm able to relate to my life. Secondly, and very importantly, many of our sisters complain that there aren't enough lectures on the great woman of Islam. I have to agree with them. Many times the lectures are about the great men of Islam. Yes. Now, no doubt we have the mention of 124,000 prophets, for example. And we have the mention, for example, of the 12th Imams. 
And normally, if you're going to give a lecture about great women, who are the two you normally give lectures about? Sayyidah Fatima, Sayyidah Fatima and Sayyidah Zainab. Zainab. But there are many other great women who looked after the heritage of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, aside from the greatness of Sayyidah Fatima and Sayyidah Zainab. There should be lectures on Asma bint Umais, mm -hmm. Fatima bint Asad, Sumayya, the mother of Ammar bin Yasser. Yes. You look at the likes of, for example, Um Ayman, Sayyidah Fidda, yeah. Bibi Um Kulthum, Hamida, the wife of Imam al-Sadiq And this lady, when we're going to look at her biography, I want to ask in 28 years, what did she achieve? There may be those who are listening to this program, watching this program, who themselves have reached the mid-20s now. And now they've got to reflect upon themselves, what have I given back? Yeah. So it's very important that when we're looking at the biography of Sayyidina Ma'asuma, it's very important for us to look at it with the intention of applying the lessons into our life rather than <clears throat> just the praise that may emerge because of her association with the Ahlul Bayt. So in terms of her biography, let's kick off with where she was born and who her parents were. We know Imam Musa Al-Qazim is her father, but what about her mother? And um, Her mother's interesting. You know, she's born in the 173rd year after Hijrah. Her mother is a lady by the name of Najma. Okay. Some mention her name as Tuktam. She has a couple of other titles, such as Umm al banin such as Tahira, but the main mm. name that we see within the traditions is Najma. Najma. She becomes the second lady from North Africa to give birth to an wow. Imam of Ahl al Bayt. Wow. The first of them was who? Hamida, the wife of Imam al Sadiq, okay. who gave birth to Imam al Kadhim. Imam al Sadiq marries a lady from North Africa. Now, some may ask, why would Imam al Sadiq marry a lady from North Africa? Why would Imam al Sadiq, for example, marry a lady from? Medina, let's say, from one of his relatives, Maria Sayyida, for example, mm -hmm. from the grandchildren of Imam al-Hasan, for example. Why does Imam al-Sadiq marry from North Africa? Why does Imam al-Kadhim also marry from North Africa? It's as if the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, salam, there are a couple of aims. Number one, when you marry from a different race, different country, the cultures can come together. Yes. New alliances can be formed. Mm -hmm. Knowledge of one another can expand. If you only continue to be in the same village, the same city, <laughs> sometimes that could be a very narrow-minded approach. It can work. But there are sadly certain fathers out there or certain mothers who tell their children, we will only marry from our village. Mm -hmm. Not from our city even. <laughs> from our really? village. We'll only marry from our village. The <coughs> Imams of Ahlul Bayt, had begun earlier, mind you. Imam al Hussein salam, had married a lady from Iran. Yes. Imam Zain al Abidin had married a lady from Sindh. Okay, that's the uh, India area. Yes. Correct. Yeah. Who gave birth to Zayd, yes. the son of Imam Zain al Abidin. Salam. And likewise, Imam al Sadiq salam, marries Hamida. Imam al Kanum, salam, when he marries Najma, mm -hmm. it's his mother, Hamida, that tells him to marry Najma. Okay. For in a dream, she sees the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, telling her, mm -hmm. choose Najma for your son. Oh, Imagine if the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, has recommended you in marriage, you must mm -hmm. be something great. Yes. This lady, therefore, is from North Africa. Today, subhanAllah, in our communities, I do sometimes wonder that if a revert came and proposed for your sister or my sister, mm -hmm. Sometimes you may find that some of the parents in our communities, they'll turn around and they'll say, well, how do we know their background? But, 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 but. <laughs> but you found that Imams of Ahlul Bayt, a number of them married reverts. <coughs> One may argue half of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt were married to reverts. Mm -hmm. Today in our community, sometimes reverts find it extremely difficult to get married. Yeah. Because there is a stigma attached to giving your daughter, for example, to someone from a black background or someone from a white background or someone from a different colored background. Whereas the Imams of Ahlul Bayt salam, you find, Imam al-Sadiq marries from Africa, Imam al-Kadhim, Africa. 
to the extent that Imam al radha was of darker complexion, Imam Al-Jawad, mm -hmm. there were some people who didn't believe he was an Imam because he was black. Wow. Now, can you imagine today if the Imam of our time turns out to be of a darker complexion than us? I guarantee you there'll be people whose racist undertone and some of their rhetoric will emerge. Mm -hmm. So therefore, on the first level, the imams thought that you can build alliances, bringing people together. But on the second level, the imams also were telling us that this racism should be removed from your communities. Isn't it a shame when you hear there are certain reverts who try to propose for sisters in the community and the parents who are not having it, they don't care. Mm -hmm. This person's a lover of Ahl al-Bayt, this person is knowledgeable, this person is this. It's as if none of us have studied the lives of the Ahl al-Bayt. So the father... Imam al kadhim alayhi salam. The mother, Najma. Najma, a lady who the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family had already spoken about mm -hmm. many years earlier. So in terms of North Africa, are we looking at Egypt, Libya, or are we looking at Nubian? Yeah, well, you know, according to some, there were a couple of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt alayhi salam who were um, married to ladies from the Nubian area, mm -hmm. and some who were married to Berbers. And so the Berbers are still around until today. One can see, for example, um, between Morocco and Tunisia and Algeria, there are yes. pockets mm. of the communities who have their own language. Um, but yes, you find that she was from that part of the world. Mashallah. And in terms of Imam Qadim, how many children did he actually have? Because I've heard that it was in double figures. There was a lot, mashallah. Well, Imam al Qadim alayhi salam, may Allah bless him, 37 children, that's, that's what I heard. Yeah. 19 daughters, Mashallah. 18 sons. And that's why you'll notice that wherever you travel in the world, <coughs> there's always Sadat from the Musawis. Uh, like I'm a Musawi, Mashallah. for example. And many times people say to me, but then if you're a Musawi, why is your name not said Ammar al-Musawi? You'll find that all of us originally in our names, Musawi is within our names. Mm -hmm. Naturally, there are certain parts of the world which you migrate from at certain intervals, which you put as a distinction. But all of us go back, the Musawi Sadat, all of us go back to Imam Musa al -Kadhim. If you go Pakistan, yeah. Musawis. Loads, yeah. Lebanon, Musawis. Iraq, Musawis. Iran, mm -hmm. Musawis. Imam Musa al MashaAllah, 37 children. MashaAllah. 19 daughters, 18 sons. So do you think this is a sunnah that we should, you know, uh, a tradition we should carry well, if on? Well, if, if, you, if you're energetic <laughs> enough, um, I think, you know, the imams of Ahl al-Bayt, it varies because Imam al radha alayhi salam, mm -hmm. on the other hand, has reached the middle of his 40s and is still yeah. not having one child. Mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he plans as he pleases. True. There must be a wisdom behind Imam al kadhim <coughs> have 37 children. And Imam al radha just about having Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam. In terms of children, we know that uh, the father and child relationship is very important. So, first question would be, how did Imam Musa al qadim maintain such a relationship with 37 children? And on top, what was specific or special about the relationship between him and Ma'asum Aqum? It's not easy in that period for Imam Musa al qadim alayhi salam to maintain a relationship either with his family or with his Shia. You know, the Abbasid government harassed Imam al kadhim alayhi salam a great deal. Yes. I would say that he moved from prison to prison. Over a period of 20 <coughs> years, he has moved at least four prisons. Mm -hmm. Now, one may ask the question that if the Imam died in his mid-50s, how could he have 37 children and be in prison? Yes. It's not that he's in prison for consecutive periods. Rather, he's taken from one prison to another, from one to another. And that harassment would continue. Therefore, it would be very difficult for him to maintain that relationship with the children. And it was very difficult for the children to maintain that relationship with their father because many of them were facing a great amount of coercion. But that didn't stop the imam from continuing mm -hmm. having the best of relationships with his daughters, especially... With Sayyida Fatima. Mm -hmm. Sayyida Fatima, you know, Imam Al-Kadhim loved the name Fatima. 
and all the Imams of Ahlul Bayt yes. adored the name Fatima. I remember reading one tradition where Sayyidah Fatima Ma'suma narrates from Fatima, daughter of Imam al-Sadiq, who narrates from Fatima, daughter of Imam al-Baqir, <laughs> who narrates from Fatima, daughter of Imam Zain al-Abidin who narrates from Fatima, daughter of Imam al Hussein, who narrates from Fatima, daughter of Imam al Hassan, who narrates from Fatima, daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, who narrates from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, <coughs> and they give the narration about the day of Ghadir. Wow. You found that the Ahlul Bayt السلام, adored the name Fatima. Mm-hmm. Imam al Hussein has a wonderful saying. He says, if I had a thousand sons, I would call them mm-hmm. Ali. Ali. And if I had a thousand daughters, I would call them Fatima. Fatima. You know Imam Musa al-Kanam had Fatima al-Kubra, mm-hmm. Fatima al-Sughra, Masha'ala. Fatima al-Wusta, Fatima al Wow. You would think that, okay, I named my daughter Fatima. You know how some <laughs> families have, um, for example, whatever, let's, um, John the first. Oh, John the second, junior, Charles yeah. the fourth, yes. William the sixth, yeah? Yes. The royal families would normally have. But that, you would say, would be in different times. The grandson was called different William and different yeah. generations. Yeah, the Ahlul Bayt, no. Mm-hmm. Fatima al-Kubra, Fatima al-Suhra, mm-hmm. Fatima al-Wusta, Fatima al-Ukhra. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib did the same with his daughters. Imam mm-hmm. al-Hussein did the same with his daughters. They would not be embarrassed mm-hmm. to have not one Fatima. No, they want many Fatimas. They're honored to have the name Fatima. Today in our communities, I find that there are certain people who are <coughs> embarrassed mm-hmm. and some who don't want to call the name Fatima. You say, why don't you want to call the name yeah. Fatima? Some turn around and say, well, you know, we already have many Fatimas in the family. Mm-hmm. It's, it's only common. about two or three, <laughs> but they make it sound like there's 500 Fatimas in the family. Yeah. Wallah, if there was 500, then make it 1,000. Make it 10,000. Let the legacy of Fatima al-Zahra السلام, continue. Hassan. And the legacy of Fatima, daughter of Imam al Hussein, and Fatima, daughter of Imam al-Sadiq, and Fatima, daughter of Imam al-Kadhim, say the Fatima Mahsouma Qum. When I see some who are saying we should have modern names now, you hear the weirdest names these days. What's a modern name? I don't know what a modern name, you know, one of my friends described this aptly when he said it looks like um, some modern name they've given to a nail polish color or something, you know. You look at some of these names and you're wondering where did you get these names from? Someone's clearly either gone on Google Mm -hmm. or someone's gone on nice Persian name, nice Turkish name, (laughs) some name with a meaning which, okay, maybe it's, (coughs) you know, flower in the middle of the, you know, in the middle of some some rainforest rainforest somewhere. (laughs) But is that the same as having the name of the greatest woman to have ever lived on this earth? Yes, sir. Why would Ahl al-Bayt say Fatima al-Kubra and Fatima al-Sukhra and Fatima al-Wusta and Fatima al-Ukhra? Ahl al-Bayt السلام, were telling us that if every generation, if you want to call your daughter Fatima or you call her Zahra, mm-hmm. or you give her any of the other titles of the Ahl al-Bayt السلام, this preserves the identity of the Ahl al-Bayt. Yes, How many sir. times... When you meet someone called Ali or you meet someone called Fatima, <laughs> it really softens the heart Indeed. when a person is in that one moment. So you found that those people who today are saying we have too many Fatimas, Imam al kadhim alayhi salam, no. Imam al kadhim alayhi salam from the beginning wanted his daughter to be named after Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. And you found that his relationship with his daughter was unique. She loved him mm-hmm. and he has a famous line about her where he one day says Fidaha abuha may her li- may my life may her father's life be sacrificed for her if you look at say the fatima masuma the amount of knowledge she gained from her father it highlights that how important it is for the father to have a role in instilling ilm knowledge mm-hmm. and wisdom hikmah into the lives of their young children. Sometimes we spend fortunes on the education of our kids when it yes. comes to biology, chemistry, physics, mm-hmm. English literature, history. We want them to go to the top prep schools, the top private yes. schools and so on. But likewise, there needs to be that major investment mm-hmm. in the lives of our children when it comes to their Islamic knowledge. Yes. 
-hmm. when it comes to their knowledge of their heritage. Do you know that there have been books called, for example, Musnad Fatima al Masuma? No. Oh, a wow. whole collection by Sayyid Kupari. Wow. Sayyid Kupari, one of the scholars, and you can find it in Qum um, mm -hmm. 1996 okay. publication, if I'm not mistaken, Musnad Fatima al Masuma. A whole collection of the ahadith. Oh, I remember Sayyid um, Muhammad al Abtahi. In, uh, in the 17th volume of Awalim al Ulum, he has a whole section about the traditions narrated from Sayyida Fatima Masuma. Wow. She's not great because she's daddy's daughter or Imam mm. al Radha's sister. She herself ensured that there was a preservation of the knowledge of Ahlul Bayt. I'll give you an example. There were, the tradition of Ghadir, I said to you, yes. it's narrated from Fatima al Masuma and her mm. sister Um Kulthum and mm. her sister Zainab. Mm -hmm. From Fatima, daughter of Imam, Imam Sadiq. From Fatima, daughter of Imam Bakr. From Fatima, daughter of Imam Sajjad. From Fatima, daughter of Imam Hussein. From Fatima, daughter of Imam Hassan. From Fatima, daughter of Rasulullah. That on the day of Ghadir, the Holy Prophet raised the hand of Ali mm. and told the people. Am I not the mm -hmm. first in authority from amongst all of you? And they said to him, Indeed, yes, yes, O Prophet of God. He said, Man kuntu mawla, mawla. Whoever I am the master of, whoever I am the first in authority of, now Ali. Allahumma wali man wala. Wa'adi man ada. Wansur man nasara. Wa'khdhul man khadala. O oh Allah. This tradition <coughs> is from who? Sayyidah Fatima Asuma. O oh Allah. Be a supporter to whoever takes Ali ibn Abi Talib as their guardian. Mm -hmm. And an enemy to whoever takes Ali ibn Abi Talib as their enemy. enemy. And a helper to whoever takes Ali ibn Abi Talib as their leader. leader. And those who try to fight Ali ibn Abi Talib, oh Allah, be against them. Who is the one who narrates this tradition? Fatima Ma'asum. Let me give you another tradition. Please. Ali, the Holy Prophet, tells him. Mm -hmm. أنت مني بمنزلة هارون من موسى أو علي you are to me like Harun was to except there is no prophet after me علي is to me like Aaron was to Moses famous tradition who narrates it in that generation say the Fatima al Masuma the night of Miraj when the Holy Prophet goes on the night of Miraj she narrates from Fatima from Fatima from Fatima the daughter of Rasulullah says my Grandfather on the night of Mi'raj saw one of the curtains, one of the veils. It said, "Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah, wa ashhadu anna Ali an waliyallah." Subhanallah. And then later, she says that when he continued on his journey, he saw a curtain, and on it says, "Bakhin, bakhin, man mithlu shi'at Ali." That congratulations, congratulations. Who is there like the Shi'a of Ali? She narrates that tradition as well. Then there is another tradition that she narrates that Safiya, the auntie of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, mm -hmm. was next to Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. <coughs> and of course, these narrations, Fatima Masum was not alive at the time, but mm -hmm. these are the, this is the isnad yes. from the ladies all the way and showed how mm -hmm. many ladies were preserv preservers of hadith yes. in early Islam. And she narrates that Safiya, the auntie of the uh, Prophet, peace be upon his family, was sitting next to Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. And while sitting next to Fatima Zahra, السلام, she sees Imam al Hussein السلام, begin to uh, crawl and she tells Fatima al Zahra that shouldn't you wash him mm. as he's now crawling on the ground? And that the reply was, How could you wash the one who Allah has decided to purify? Who narrates that? Sayyidina Fatima. Also, many times we assume a shaheed is someone who dies on the battlefield. Isn't that true? Yes, true. Many we Muslims that have that assumption mm -hmm. that a shaheed is the one who dies on the battlefield. battlefield. Whereas you find that one of the wonderful traditions from Sayyidah Fatima Masuma is the tradition Man Mata Ala Hubbi Al Muhammad. Mata Kaenna Shaheed. Whoever dies. With the love of Ahlul Bayt dies Shri. as a martyr. So here you have all of these traditions 
which are narrated to us from her. And that's why it's no surprise. I remember Ayatollah al-Mustanbat, one of the grand scholars of Najaf, may Allah bless his soul. He mentions that one of the manuscripts that was found in the Shushtari library was a manuscript that discussed the life of Sayyida Masuma. Mm -hmm. At a very young age, a group of people had come to visit her father, Imam al kadhim Imam was not at home. Mm -hmm. They said to her father, they said to her, where's your dad? She says, not here. She said, we had some questions we wanted to ask him. Maybe when he comes back, we'll ask him. She said, give me the question. Mm -hmm. They said, what do you mean? I said, give me the question. She answered each question. Oh, Theological, legal, historical. Look mm -hmm. at that young age. Because remember, she was 10 when her dad died. So imagine okay. what a sponge of knowledge she took wow. in, in those 10 years that she's already answering all these questions. The narration mentions that when these people got their answers, now they're a bit baffled at this moment because they're thinking, hold on a minute. Mm -hmm. This young girl's just answering <laughs> our questions. But she... then again, this young girl's not just any young girl. So they narrate <clears throat> that on our way back, we saw Imam al kalam alayhi mm salam. -hmm. And when we saw the Imam, he's, they said, oh, Imam, we had come to ask you some questions. He's like, you know, I was out. Mm -hmm. Forgive me. So they said, but your daughter Fatima answered the questions. The moment he heard that, he saw the questions she answered. There was, you know, that sense when a father sees his daughter has done something making him proud or yes. graduated or mm -hmm. got married. Or, combine all of these. He raised his voice. He said, Fidaha Abuha. May her father be sacrificed for her. Because at that moment, that sense of pride, mm -hmm. that my daughter's knowledge has served the community. Our yes, daughters son. today, our sons, let's not take their younger years for granted. They yes. are bright. They are yes. sharp. I'm saddened sometimes when I go to certain mosques. <clears throat> the lecturer's lecture is clearly a lecture mm -hmm. which is structured for the adults. They let these kids go and run around outside not gaining any knowledge, or they force these kids to sit in an adult's lecture, there mm. rather should be an area where the kids have got access to someone younger, giving them a lecture at their level. Because the height of wisdom is that you speak to the people, On the to level. the minds, mm -hmm. to the intellect, at the level of the people. It's sad when I see that up until the age of 10, 15, there are some mosques within the Muslim world who don't care about these kids. All they care is, you know what, let the kids come to the mosque and then let them run around and just play. Mm -hmm. Playing is one aspect, but let them learn the Quran. Let them learn the traditions of Ahl al-Bayt So you found in those early years, her relationship with her father was a relationship where she took so much knowledge from him. Right. But then naturally, it was only a few years later when the difficulties began. In terms of the actual political situation at that time, um, what was actually going on uh, with, with uh, Imam Musa al Qabim and uh, the, the Khalifate at that time? Yeah, as I said, it's a, it's a <coughs> very difficult period for anyone who's Shia under Harun mm. Rashid's government or under Al Hadi or Mahdi Abbasi just before him is going through arguably one of the toughest times the Shia community has ever gone through. As mm. in, if there's one act that was practiced, like it was practiced by Ammar bin Yasser when he was being tortured by Abu Jahl. Like it was practiced by the Mu'min of Al Fir'aun in the mm -hmm. story um, in Surah 40 verse 28 when he conceals his Iman. The one act known as Taqiyya. Taqiyya mm -hmm. is when a person in a matter of life and death conceals their beliefs. Because you could get killed. Can we clarify something before we continue the conversation? Sure. In terms of, we see... With the, the famous Shia Sunni debates, which have become quite popular now, Sunnis always accusing us of the intaqiyah. Always saying, oh, are you doing taqiyah? You're not mentioning this, you're not talking about this or that. For the Shias that are watching today, what is taqiyah and I mean, when is it actually applied properly? Imam al-Sadiq makes it clear that taqiyah is my religion and the religion of my forefathers. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned in the Quran, in chapter 40, verse 28, there is... A person who was known as the Mu'min of Al-Fir'aun. Mm -hmm. 
Quran mentions that this mu'min of Al Fir'aun, this believer from the people of Pharaoh, Quran mentions Yaktumu Imana, he concealed mm -hmm. his faith. He concealed his faith because revelation of his faith could end up causing his death. Pharaoh mm -hmm. would have killed him. Some mention him <coughs> in the traditions as Ezekiel or Hizqal. Mm -hmm. We also find that Ammar bin Yasin, chapter 16, verse 106 of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Except the one who is compelled while his heart has belief. Mm -hmm. Ammar was tortured so much that he uttered words which were completely contradictory to what he believed in his heart. Taqiyya is that concealing of faith in a moment of life and death. But if I'm involved in a discussion with someone, mm -hmm. don't need to perform taqiyya. Unless I fear that the psycho who may be standing in front of me will get a knife out and kill me. Mm -hmm. And I would hope the Muslims amongst each other would never go that low. Yeah. can have a discussion, Indeed. can differ at the end. Mm -hmm. Your theological conclusions may differ. If someone keeps telling me, that you're doing taqiyya, you're doing taqiyya. No, I don't see this as a life and death situation. I may not be as blunt as I can be mm -hmm. about my opinions on certain issues with you because I have recognition that certain personalities who you revere, mm -hmm. I don't. I don't want to yes. speak about them in that way because I recognize there has to be a, <coughs> a, a, a sense of, respect. of yeah, yes. a, a cordial, Mm -hmm. uh, relationship, you know, a sense of respect, as you mentioned, a sense of a reconciliatory type tone. Mm -hmm. But you find that in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear. Um, if you look in Surah 3, verse 28, I would say that's the clearest ayah on taqiyya. لا يتخذ المؤمنون الكافرون أولياء من دون المؤمنين وما يفعل ذلك فليس من الله في شيء إلا أن تتقوا منهم تقات. Surah 3, verse 28 that the believers should not take their disbelievers as guardians ahead of the believers. If you do this and you do take the disbelievers ahead of the believers, yes. then you go away from the path of Allah, except if you are safeguarding your life at that moment. So this idea that I know is brandished about many times where they mm -hmm. say that you Shia, <laughs> you're all doing taqiyya, you're all yeah. liars. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, the akhlaq of the Shia. Mm -hmm is that they recognize the feelings of the person on the other end of the discussion. The problem is when we don't do taqiyya, then we're called the people who curse and the people who yes. abuse and so on. <laughs> so on the one hand, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Mm -hmm. If you say what you believe, they call you sectarian. Yeah. And if you don't say what you believe, the they say you're doing taqiyya. Yeah. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. <laughs> I wouldn't lose too much sleep over this. You know, you know, there's no need to lose sleep over these personalities mm -hmm. telling you taqiyya and taqiyya. Listen, I think it's very clear what I believe. Yeah. Um, and if you agree with it, you agree. And if you disagree, we'll, you know, yeah. we'll all go to I'll our graves on the day of judgment. <laughs> the answers, inshallah, inshallah, will be clear. But the point was that at that time, mm -hmm. you're talking, I would say, from the incident of Fakh. Okay which occurred a few years before Sayyidah Ma'asuma was born. Mm -hmm. Da'bal bin Ali al-Khuzai refers to in his poetry, there are graves in Kufa, graves in Medina, graves in Fakh. Fakh is this area, uh, you know, on the outskirts of Mecca, where some of the grandchildren of Imam al-Hassan were massacred by the Abbasids. Now you imagine, they would make the grandchildren of Imam al-Hassan, Imam al-Hussein, come every day, report their names, and make them leave. Every day you have to come and register and leave. Just to embarrass them, make a fool of them, give them worse punishments than if a, someone loyal to the Abbas, let's say someone loyal to the Abbas has drank alcohol. And someone who's associated with the Ahlul Bayt, in the sense that someone who's from the grandchildren of Imam Al-Hassan, he's got mm. some sort of association, he did something that's not religious, they will let the person from the Abbasid loyal ones off and they'll punish the Alawi. That period, you had the likes of Ali bin Yaqteen, Prime Minister of Harun al-Rashid, mm -hmm. who had to observe Taqiyya. Because if Harun al-Rashid found out that his Prime Minister was a Shia, <laughs> that guy would be executed in 30 seconds. 
Wow. And that's why, you know, the famous story when he writes to Imam al-Kadham saying, how do I do wudu? And Imam Musa al-Kadham tells him, wash your feet. Mm -hmm. As you know, the Shia do not I'm wash washing, their feet yes. in wudu. Mm -hmm. The Quran clearly says in Surah 5 verse 6, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the ayah of wudu, Surah 5 verse 6. Ya ayuha al-lathina amanu, idha qumtum ila salati faghsilu. Watch. Wujuhakum wa aidiyakum ila al-marafiq. Wamsahu biru'usakum. When the Quran mentions quite clearly in Surah 5 verse number 6 that you wash your faces and you wash your hands. The faces, the hands are to be washed. The head is to be wiped. The feet are to be wiped. Mm -hmm. But you found that Ali bin Yaqteen began to wash his feet. Mm -hmm. Harun and Rashid had heard a rumor that Ali bin Yaqtin is Shia. <laughs> he said the only way I'll find out is how he does wudu. When you saw him do wudu watching his feet, he said he's not Shia, I'll leave him. You had people like Bahlul. Mm -hmm. Many anecdotes we hear about Bahlul. Yes. Wahab bin Amr, some call him for example. A person who had to act insane. Mm -hmm. You had the likes of Muhammad bin Abi Umar and other great scholars who were executed for their loyalty to Ahlul Bayt. Mm -hmm. So that period... To be openly Shia was virtually impossible. Oh. And so you could therefore imagine when they took Imam Musa al kadhim to the prisons, yes. how difficult that was for Sayyid Ma'asuma. Definitely, definitely. Brothers and sisters, we're going for a short break. And for those of you who are on social media, please stay, stay tuned in for the second half of the show where we'll be discussing Ma'asuma Akum. And for those of you who have questions, please call in to 0203. 515-0199 and inshallah the sales will be answering all your questions. Please stay tuned and meet us after a break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dearest respective viewers, welcome back to London Live with Dr. Sayyid Amar Akshwani. If you have any questions that you would like to call in and discuss with Sayyid Amar, please call us on 0203 515 0199 and there should be a WhatsApp number at the bottom. If you don't want to talk to us, you could always WhatsApp us. Sayyid Amar, we were talking about um, Sayyid Ma'asum Aqom, her father, Imam Al Qadim. Uh, you were just discussing the political situation and, and uh, the need for taqiyah at that time. Uh, Imam Qadim himself, uh, was he performing taqiyya or and, and what was, I mean most of the time he was in prison was he not? Uh, what was it like for him? Well he's certainly not performing taqiyya, he's known as the Imam of Ahlul Bayt and, mm -hmm. um, and in the prisons Harun al Rashid <coughs> knows very well that while he's got him in prison his Shia do not have access to him. Yes. Um, there is an underground movement known as the Wakala where there are representatives of Imam al kadhim alayhi salam who are alive, who are able to look after the Shia and their different cities. But naturally, when your Imam is not with you, when your Imam is absent, yes. it's a very difficult and mm -hmm. an extremely major gaping hole to fill. And what happens is that Imam al kadhim alayhi salam, while in prison, he's making people come towards Ahl al-Bayt. Mm -hmm which naturally uh, brings about major anger from the government. Indeed, as in there indeed. are stories where, for example, they'd send the most beautiful lady into his prison, <laughs> thinking that he's going to get affected by her. Yes. She'd tell the imam that anything you would like, I'm ready to give you. The imam remains in sujood, she would narrate. Yeah. Again, she'd beg him, he'd remain in prostration. Final time, she'd tell him that, listen, please, whatever you want, I'll mm. give you. And then... He gets up from prostration and tells her, why would I want what you offer me when God offers me the following? And she, she claims that she sees God and she's never seen before. Wow. Then you've got six, seven madmen who are sent into the prison to torture the Imam, mm -hmm. who have come from a foreign land. 
when the prison guard comes in to see what they've done to the Imam, sees the Imam in prostration with these men next to him. Mm -hmm. The Imam's completely converted them by speaking to them in their language. Wow. So the Imam, while in prison, was doing the same tabliq that Nabi Yusuf had mm -hmm. done. Yes. That in prison, you may have people who are more ready to listen, people who are reflecting more, people who are contemplating about mistakes that they've made, mm. people who are ready to hear out what you have to say and the different worldviews. So Imam al-Kadhim while in prison, whether it's in Baghdad, whether it's in Basra, he was bringing people towards Ahl al-Bayt. Because of that, Harun al-Rashid knew very well that unless I get rid of him, I'm going to have a revolution from within the prisons. The prisons yeah. Ali ibn Suwaid, one of the companions of Imam al-Kadhim salam, visits the Imam and asks him the question, which we sometimes mention in relation to our Imam. Mm -hmm. Don't we say al-ajal, 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 al-faraj, al-faraj, al-faraj. He said, Imam, when is the day? When are you going to be released? And Imam tells Ali ibn Suwaid, he says to him, Friday, on the bridge of Baghdad. And so when this oh. Ali goes and tells the Shia that I have great news, Friday on the bridge of Baghdad we'll meet Imam al kadhim little does he know that on that Friday, the Imam's poison body was placed the on the bridge of Baghdad. Sayyidah Ma'suma was 10 years of age at that time. Mm -hmm. She was one of the youngest children because you know her and Imam al-Rada are from the same mother, same yes, father. Yes. Both of them are the daughters of Najma and Imam yes. al-Kadhim alayhi salam. Sayyidah Ma'asum was 10 at the time. This broke her heart. Having lost her father, number one, having not been around her father mm -hmm. for a number of years. So Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam dies 183 after Hijrah. Mm -hmm. We said Sayyidah Ma'asum was born on 173 after Hijrah. Mm -hmm. So... 183 after Hijrah, now Imam al-Rada of course assumes the authority of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt. There is a dispute among some of the Shia, some um, former sect known as the Waqifis, okay. uh, which stop with Imam al-Kadhim and do not continue with Imam al-Rada Ziyad al-Kindi amongst others. Mm -hmm. But you find that also in that time, the sons of Harun al-Rashid are having a bitter battle with one another. Okay. For the next few years, they are so embroiled in this internal Abbasid warfare mm -hmm. that one may argue that oppression is not as much as it was a few years before. Al-Ma'mun al-Abbasi overcomes his brother Al-Amin al-Abbasi. Mm -hmm. And when he overcomes him, he assumes power the power was fragmented. There are parts of the Islamic Empire which are not under his control. Mm -hmm. But he knows very well there's something which he needs to do to ensure that those who are the Shia of Al Muhammad side with him a bit more than they sided or had any respect for his father. And what mm -hmm. was that? By making his hair apparent be Imam al Rada. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. How would he do that? Make Imam al Rada leave the land. Uh -huh. To go to where? To go towards the land of Khurasan. Mm -hmm. He makes Imam al Rada alayhi salam leave the land of Medina. You know, they leave Baghdad, they leave Medina, they're not allowed to stay there anymore. And he goes towards where? He goes towards Khurasan about yes. 17 years after the death of Imam al Kadhim alayhi salam. Mm -hmm. Now, in this period, the other children of Imam al Kadhim alayhi salam are living, for example, in Medina. But the mm -hmm. amount of difficulties that they face means a lot of them have to go and live elsewhere. Okay. That's why we know about Fatima Ma'suma Qom, but there are other daughters of Imam al kadhim Nobody knows about them. Oh. You know, we have two daughters of Imam al kadhim buried in Azerbaijan. Wow. So when we do Ziyarah trips, some of us go on Ziyarah, let's say to Iraq, some go on oh. Ziyarah to Iran, some go on Ziyarah to Syria. Sham. How many have gone Ziyarah to Azerbaijan? I don't even know that it was... I say there are a couple right of there. places. Honestly, there are a couple of places like Baalbek in Lebanon. Yes. And in Azerbaijan. I would say between those two areas, you have four of the children, five of the children 
of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt salam with mm. Dariqs there, wow. with a mosque where people go and pray, and many people don't go and do their ziyara. You have some of the daughters of Imam Al-Kadhim had to go and live in Asfahan. Mm -hmm. Some of the daughters of Imam Al-Kadhim had to go and live in Rasht. Some had to go and live in different parts of Iran. The sons of Imam Al-Kadhim mm. You had, for example, Ahmed and Muhammad, who are uh, also buried in Iran. Mm. I think their area where they're buried is called Shah Charag or something, and it's okay. meant to be this wonderful uh, mosque of lights. Absolutely. Wonderful area where one of the ulama had seen light coming out and knew that hmm. only the sons of an Imam of Ahlul Bayt could be buried there. But what are they doing there? Why are there some in Shiraz? Why some hmm. in Asfahan? Why some in Azerbaijan? Why are they in these different areas? Why are they over there? What's going on? It's because of the amount of oppression that the wow. children of Imam Al Kadhim salam faced. And because of that, that means that there are many who cannot get married. Mm. Because if one of you has had to go and live in Azerbaijan, and another of you has had to go and live in parts of Iran, which you're not used to, and others of you, God knows if any had to go and live in Pakistan, uh, had to mm. go and live in India at that time, or the Indo-Pak subcontinent, I would not be surprised. Isfahan, Shiraz, um, Azerbaijan, of the outskirts of Baku and other areas, People had to go from these mm. children. Now, who are they going to get married to? Exactly. So this myth that was created that the daughters of Imam Al-Kadhim did not get married because there was no Sadat is absolute mm. nonsense. Mm. It's because there was a no, time no, 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 no. of oppression, mm -hmm. a time of poverty. And because of that oppression, because of that poverty that took place, which affected them in their life, Many, and there was a third issue. Some people couldn't even get married to these ladies because to be an in law of the Ahlul Bayt would also possibly bring you prison. Mm -hmm. So that period was an extremely turbulent period. And it becomes more difficult for her that her brother from the same mother who she adores mm -hmm. now is separated from her. Oh. That she had him as her backbone when he was around. Now he goes where? Khurasan. What do we say, Sayyid Muhsin, in the ziyarah of Imam al-Radha alayhi salam in the mosque? Mm. How do we begin the ziyarah of Imam al-Radha? So Imam al-Husayn, you begin, As-salamu alayka ya Abu Abdullah wa ala al-arwaha allati halla bi finaik. Imam al-Radha, we say, As-salamu alayka ya gharib al We say he is the stranger, the lonely one in the far away mm. lands. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, you have a couple of Imams in Iraq, a couple of Imams in Medina. But there's only one man in Khurasan. Yes. And his sisters, his mm. brothers, all of them are far away from him. And for a sister to see her brother far away mm -hmm. was extremely difficult for her. Yes. Especially, she's only in her 20s. She cannot take it anymore. What does she decide? I'm going to go towards my brother. Quickly for the viewers watching that if you'd like to call in with a question, please call us on 0203 515 0199 and I'm sure the Sayyid will be more than happy to answer your questions. Sorry Sayyid for cutting you off over there. So she goes towards um, her brother, oh, she so. yearns yeah. to see her brother and she knows it's not an easy time because while her brother publicly, the news is that her brother is going to be the successor of Al-Ma'moon. Deep yeah. down, her brother knows this is where I'm going to die. He tells Da'bal bin Ali al-Khuza'i yeah. that add a line in your poem that there's going to be a grave yeah. in Tus as well. Mm -hmm. And even he would make it clear that when you come to visit him, Imam al-Radha would not remain silent. Because you know some people would say that how is it that Imam al-Radha could become the successor of an oppressive Khalifa or work mm -hmm. with an oppressive Khalifa? Imam al radha alayhi salam, when some of the people were saying this, that how dare you, even in our communities today, yeah. if you work in a government that's a non-Muslim government mm -hmm. or an oppressive government, they call you a sellout. Yeah. Or they <laughs> say that yeah. that person is working with a munafiq government or a kafir yeah, yeah. government. Okay, question. When they said to Imam al radha alayhi salam, how dare you work with al-Ma'moon? Mm -hmm. Imam al radha alayhi salam turned around to them, he said, let me ask you a question. In your eyes, who's greater, a prophet or a successor of a prophet? He said, prophet. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Who's worse, kafir or mushrik? They said mushrik. 
He said, what do you say about a prophet who worked for a mushrik? They said, never. He said, Nabi Yusuf السلام, didn't become the treasurer of the king of Egypt. Yes. Mm-hmm. Nabi Yusuf السلام, asked to become the treasurer of the king of Egypt. He said, قَالَ جَعَلْنِي عَلَىٰ خَزَائِنِ الْأَرْضِ إِنِّي حَفِيظٌ عَلِيمٌ Make me the treasurer of the king of Egypt. Whereas I, when I go to work, mm-hmm. alongside al Ma'mun, I'm forced to be here. Yeah. It's not my choice. Imam Nabi Yusuf asked to be the treasurer of Egypt. He asked to work in a government that was a non-Muslim mm-hmm. government. Whereas I've been forced to come to Mashhad. Two people came to Imam al alayhi salam. And they said to him, we've come from a long distance. Do we pray full or qasr? He asked the first one, who you come to see? Mm-hmm. <laughs> he said, I've come to see you. He said, and you? He said, I've come to see al Ma'mun." He said, you who've come to see me, it's qasr. Mm-hmm. For you who's come to see al Ma'mun, mm-hmm. pray full. It doesn't matter anymore whether you pray full or qasr <laughs> when you come to see someone like him. That's a big thing to say. Indeed. Likewise, when he would give a lecture, and he would say in his famous lecture that famous hadith al-Qudsi kalimat la ilaha illallah husni faman dakhila husni amina min adhabi that the words there is no God but Allah is the fortress of Allah. Yes. Whoever enters my fortress mm-hmm. is saved and immune from any punishment. And people were like, okay, it was a general comment. Then he'd say, I am one of the conditions of la ilaha illallah. I. Imam al Rada, I'm one of the conditions of La ilaha illallah. Now, when he's saying that, he's making it clear that, listen, I'm not here enjoying myself alongside this Al Ma'mun. Al Ma'mun would be infuriated that this Imam al Rada would be so audacious to say something like this. So, Al Ma'mun would try and bring, for example, priests, rabbis, swamis, the heads of the Gudwaras <laughs> to debate Imam al Rada. Yeah, yeah. And you find one of the great Qummi scholars, because tonight mm-hmm. is a night of Qum. Hey. You look at someone like Sheikh al-Saduq. Yes. You look at the work such as, for example, Ayun Akbar al-Rida, which is in English now. Mm-hmm. Also Kitab al-Tawheed. Kitab al-Tawheed al-Saduq. But Ayun Akbar al-Rida, I would say, on focus on Imam al-Rida mm-hmm. and the discussion, in that work, the debate Imam al-Rida has with the priests, that one priest who said to him, who's greater, Jesus or Muhammad? And Imam al-Rida alayhi salam said, mm-hmm. Jesus is a great prophet. prophet yeah. But Muhammad's greater. He mm-hmm. said, how dare you say that? Why do you say that? He said, because Muhammad prayed and fasted more than Jesus. Mm-hmm. So then the Christian priest said, how I dare you me. say someone prayed more than our Lord Jesus? Mm-hmm. To which Imam al-Radha replied, if he is your Lord, then can you tell me who he was praying to? <laughs> These discussions would occur. They'd occur on a regular basis. And when they'd occur on this regular basis, this would bring anger to al Ma'mun. He would not mm-hmm. be happy. He'd find it audacious. At the same time, Ahmed and Muhammad, sons of, uh, sons of Imam al the brothers of Imam al-Rada, they tried to get to Imam al-Rada, but on the way, you'd find some of them would be killed, for example. Mm-hmm. At the same time, there were grandsons of Imam al-Hassan who were uprising against al Ma'mun. Sayyidah Ma'suma, therefore, when she went on her journey to visit her brother, was going at a time of extreme sensitivity. Mm-hmm. There were uprisings happening against the Abbasids. Mm-hmm. From either the grandsons of Imam al-Hassan and even some of the grandsons of Imam al-Hussein were joining some of these uprisings. When therefore Sayyidah uh, Ma'suma was going towards Mashhad, on the way, 20 odd members of her family were killed. She was taken by the Shia of Qum at that time. So they were Shia? They were Shia and Qum at okay. that time. The Ash'arites, the Ironically, the descendants of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari were amongst the Shia of Qum. They settled from Yemen in Qum. Mm-hmm. They used to have majalis there. And, of course, we had said, Imam al-Sadiq had mentioned, Fatima will be buried in Qum. So people had yes. heard that tradition. Uh-huh. So people went towards... In preparation. In preparation. And she stayed in Qum. Some narrations mention that she may have been poisoned by one of the women. Mm-hmm. And she dies there in Qum. And this brings great sadness to Imam al-Rada alayhi salam. You know Imam al-Rada is the one who called her Ma'suma? Not Imam al kadhim mm-hmm. Not Imam al-Sadiq. It's funny you mentioned that. Uh, we've got a question here on, on the WhatsApp that 
Why is she known as Ma'asuma? Is she part of the 14 infallibles or is it just them only? It's a very good question. The person who called her Ma'asuma mm -hmm. was Imam al Rada alayhi salam. In the famous tradition, Man zara al Ma'asuma biqum kaman zarani. Whoever visits the Ma'asuma in Qum, it's as if they have visited me. You know, after Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, one may argue the greatest ziyarah is that of Imam al-Rada alayhi salam. And Imam al-Rada alayhi salam says, Man zara al ma'asuma biqum ka man zarani. Whoever visits the ma'asuma. Question. We said ma'asum means the error free. Yes? Mm -hmm. Infallible. Infallible, some say. Yeah. But we said there's 14 of them. Indeed. So how could she be? Because her name is Fatima. <laughs> hey. My Imam al-Rada said, Man zara al-ma'asuma. We have Asmat al-Kubra, Asmat al-Suhra. Asmat al-Kubra, the 14 ma'asumin, they'll never make a mistake, they'll never commit a sin. Not because they can't, but rather because they choose not, not to. to. They know if I say they can't sin, then yeah. I'm, it's a robot I'm following. Hmm. I don't want to be following robots. Many times... There are people in the Shia community who think that ma'asum means that this person is like a robot on the earth, they can't sin. Mm -hmm. But then if an imam can't sin, then when I look at that imam and, and see that they can't sin, I think to myself, well, how can I then take them as a role model? Exactly. How can you imitate? Uh, so imam, imam Zain al-Abdeen alayhi salam on one occasion, someone says to him, when you say you're ma'asum, does it mean you can't sin? He says, no. We can, but we wouldn't. Mm -hmm. He said, what do you mean? He said, if I asked you to walk in the street naked, can you? Mm -hmm. He said, yes, I can. He said, would you? <laughs> he said, no, I wouldn't. He said, why? He said, because the people are watching. Mm -hmm. He said, likewise with us. We can commit a sin, but we wouldn't mm -hmm. because of the respect of the Lord that's watching. Asma al-Kubra, the 14 months. Asma al suhra there are certain personalities who were so obedient to Allah that the grace of infallibility at one stage of their life, that grace was showered upon them. Mm -hmm. Likewise, say that when an Imam calls you ma'asuma, mm -hmm. what's he telling us? That this lady has never committed a sin until the day she entered this grave. Her life was a life of complete obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, when the Imam says, Man zara al ma'asuma biqum ka man zarani, he is the one who gave her that title. So today when people say, Bibi ma'asuma qum, or we're going ziyar ma'asuma qum, that came from Imam al-Rada alayhi salam. In terms of qum, we know that today ma'asuma qum is there and also the seminaries, the hawza, does, does Qum have a tradition of great scholars? Does Ma'asuma Qum have any effect or her being there have any? Is, any, is it a coincidence that she's there, this honorable lady of great knowledge? And now, today, there is a fountain of knowledge in that area. Qum has been and continues to be a center of bastions of knowledge. Truly, the person who is able to go to Qum, study in Qum, sit in the great circles of our scholars in Qum mm -hmm. is a person who has been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As in, no doubt there is nothing that comes near Najaf in terms of the grandness of the seminary of Najaf. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the soul of Shaykh al tusi for what he established in the land of Najaf that when we come now close to the thousandth anniversary, mm -hmm. you come towards seeing the great scholars who have graduated from Najaf. But then you look at Qum. I mentioned earlier, Sheikh al Saduq. Yes. Where do you get an erudite, phenomenal scholar like Sheikh al Saduq? You know, Najaf, mm -hmm. Qum, Baghdad, Hilla. 
these areas produced phenomenal scholarship. Yes. And it's no surprise when you look at some of the greatest ulama who lived near Qum, mm -hmm. how much of an effect Sayyida Ma'suma's presence there has on their life. Like the ulama who lived in Najaf, how much oh, really? Imam Amir al muminins presence has an effect on their life. Shahid al mutahari narrates, he says, I met many great thinkers. But never had I met a person who was a great thinker and had that much love for Ahl al-Bayt like Allama al Yes? Mm -hmm. He says there was something unique about Allama al in the month of Ramadan in his relationship with Sayyida Ma'suma. Mm -hmm. He says at iftar time, you know iftar time, Shah Ramadan, mm -hmm. I'll be the first to admit, I'm going crazy. <laughs> Saying, you know what, are you sure it's not iftar time? It looks like it's dark. Please get the food ready. Do this, do that. I just want to eat. You want to eat. Cameraman wants to eat. Everybody wants to eat. I'm, I'm a Shirazi, so I probably ate already. <laughs> you probably ate already. <laughs> Many of us have heard of the great scholar Ayatollah Najafi Mar'ashi. Ayatollah Mar'ashi mm -hmm. Najafi. His father had a wish. He wanted to know where was the grave of Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. He waited and waited and waited. He says, one day in my dream, I saw Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. Mm -hmm. And he said, hold on to the karima of Ahl al-Bayt. He said, that's exactly why I, what I've been trying to do. I want to find her grave. He goes, visit Sayyida Ma'suma. Mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has concealed the grave of Fatima Zahra, but in replacement, you go to the grave of Sayyida Ma'suma. MashaAllah. So you found that Imam al-Sadiq had already mentioned Fatima will be buried in Qum. She will intercede for all of the Shia. What greatness does this lady have? Mm -hmm. So there are many ulama, great scholars who had a major effect in their lives due to the presence of Sayyida Ma'suma in the land of Qum. I believe we have a caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Your name and where you're calling from? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Your name, please. Bit of a bad line. If you can, please try and call again and we'll put you through to the show. So, you know, we were talking about um, uh, the ziyara of Ma'asum Akum, and, you know, you touched lightly on its importance, its greatness. Any more hadith or any more indication to, you know, this lady and, and what her ziyara actually means. And there is even a tradition from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt where they stress whoever visits Sayyidah Ma'suma, Jannah becomes obligatory for them. Seriously. Imagine. MashaAllah. Jannah becomes obligatory. From Imam Musa al Kadhim, from Imam al Sadiq, Jannah, heaven becomes obligatory for the ones who visit Fatima, the daughter of Imam al Kadhim. But when you go to visit Sayyidah Ma'suma, as I always say, it shouldn't just be a case when you visit any of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt or you visit any of the children of Al Muhammad. It should be a moment of reflection for you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't need to just pick up Mafatih al Jinan as some people do. They'll pick up the Mafatih, read the dua, okay, page 79 to 81, I've read the ziyara, now I leave. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just about sitting there, looking yeah. who's buried next to her grave. Looking at what these personalities, what they dedicated back towards the Ahlul Bayt mm -hmm. alayhi mm -hmm. So I think it's very important for us to go on that ziyara, not just with the intention of Jannah, but to gain from the knowledge and the status of this grand lady. MashaAllah. I believe we have a caller on the line. Let's try again. Assalamu alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? Assalamu alaikum. So we're having te technical difficulties at the moment. If you can, please call again and we'll try to get you through to the doctor. Sayyidina Ma'asum uh, Aqom, we were talking about you know, the, her, her ziyara being so important. Do you feel the community has neglected such a great personality? I think the word neglected is, is, is harsh. Mm -hmm. Because you've got to remember, she has the competition uh -huh. of you know, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, <laughs> But I would say that in the same way, if you're going to go Hajj, 
you should never neglect the Prophet and the Imams mm -hmm. of Ahlul Bayt in Medina. Definitely. Likewise, if you're going to go to Mashhad to visit Imam al Rada alayhi salam, try and make a stop at Sayyidah Ma'asumah. Mm -hmm. Try and encourage your younger children to know about this lady. Try and sit there in the mausoleum. I had the honor of being there, I would say, about you know, 11 months ago. That's and right. I had the honor of cleaning the mausoleum. Oh, wow. and, and I truly say it's an honor because I know very well in Iran, there is a waiting list of people who take the even, shoes. Yeah, even the president has to wait like four years or something. The president, yeah. doctors, you know, big personalities. Mm -hmm. And really that is the greatest honor. And you see how many of the great ulama are buried around her. They found that as the biggest honor they could have in their life. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I wouldn't say neglect, but I would say <coughs> that maybe a bit more stress should be put there mm -hmm. on the greatness of this lady and the way that the ulama and of course the imams of Ahlul yes. Bayt have stressed on this. Nice. Yeah. Uh, a question we have here is that um, how can ladies today, sisters we have today, use Ma'asumakum as a role model and what, you know, I mean, what could they be doing in society, in community, uh, religiously, educationally, academically, politically? Can they use Ma'asumakum as that beacon and as that motivation to get involved? Well, I think, I think there is a psychological and, and a spiritual element to say the Ma'asumakum. Psychologically, it's, life is not always a bed of roses. You know, sometimes yeah. um, someone might have been in their 20s, their life dreams are to get married to, you know, their, their first love and, mm -hmm. you know, to have the best job and to live in a country of peace. Say the Ma'asumah saw none of these. 28 years of age, could not get married, oppression, father killed, living under oppressive government. Mm -hmm. If ever you feel that you're going through a very difficult time in your life, try and look at someone like her. Yes. And, she, and you know, when you're looking at someone like her, she's giving you a prime lesson in life that, you know what, I'm the daughter of an Imam of Ahlul Bayt, the sister of an Imam of Ahlul Bayt, but at the end of the day, even I am tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes. But Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam says in a beautiful line, do not say, Ya Allah, don't test me, for all of you will be tested. Rather say, Ya Allah, do not test me with that which shakes my faith in you. As long as whatever test we face in our life does not shake our faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then bring those tests on. So when someone today says, how can I relate to Sayyidina Ma'asumah? On the first level, here is the 28-year-old, did not have everything go her way, mm -hmm. but still left a legacy of knowledge behind. Today, I think it's fundamental that if you want to honor Sayyidina Ma'asumah alayhi salam, try and, for example, begin a magazine or a website in the name mm -hmm. of Sayyidina Ma'asumah about gaining knowledge about how to begin possibly take a career in, in serving the Ahlul Bayt by giving majalis. You know, we need a lot more speakers, both in the men and the women's side in our Definitely. mosques. We already have some people who are doing fantastic work, who are trying their hardest to serve from both genders. But I believe that we need a lot more because the demand is so high and the supply mm. is so low. So if a person out there can make a website in her name with books, um, which are downloadable, you know, where knowledge can be gained. I think that's a great service back towards uh, Sayyidah Ma'asumah. Awesome. Um, a question here, I think it's from uh, someone from a different school of thought to ours. Um, Assalamu alaikum. I have a question about Imama. People say you Shia have made all Imams higher than the Prophets because they acquired Imama. But Prophet Ibrahim Islam had both Imama and Prophethood. Why isn't he better? How do you reply to this? Jazakallah khair. Sure, um, at the end of the day for us, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen the Imams of Ahlul Bayt according to Shia theological beliefs, he is saying very clearly that the greatest man to have ever lived on this earth was the final messenger. And whoever I've chosen to be his successors as the representative must have been the greatest personalities. Awesome. This is no disrespect to the prophets who came before the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. But even if you look at the last of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, the Mahdi, yes? yes? The Mahdi is the one who leads Jesus in prayer. Yes. This is in Sunni and Shia traditions. Mm -hmm. One may turn around and say, shouldn't Nabi Isa, who's an arch prophet of God, be the one who leads the Mahdi in mm -hmm. prayer? Especially those who don't believe the Mahdi is ma'asum like we do. Yes. They just believe he's a, a just man who will bring justice at the end of time. Mm -hmm. But we know very well in Sunni and Shia traditions, the Mahdi is the one who will lead Nabi Isa in prayer. 
Likewise, there are traditions from the Prophet himself where he says, the ulama of my ummah are greater mm -hmm. or more meritorious than the prophets of the children of Israel. Who are these ulama who the Prophet is referring to who have that status? I said, yep. I said. I believe you have a caller. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, wa alaikum assalam. Your name and where you're calling from? Uh, my name is Tamvir Hussain and I'm calling Mashallah. from uh, East London. MashaAllah. Brother, assalamu alaykum. Your question, please, to the Sayyid. Um, I wanted to ask what's the best way of preaching the message of the Hadith and attracting Sunni brothers and sisters to the, to the uh, message of the Hadith and Ayyam Sun? Thank you very much, brother. Inshallah, the doctor will uh, answer. Doctor, tabligh, best methods of tabligh, especially to uh, our Sunni brothers and sisters. Well, I think uh, of the utmost importance is that we're able to disseminate the wisdom of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, to Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Believe you me, the traditions, not just of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, but Imam al-Sadiq, Imam al kadhi Imam al-Radha, many of our Sunni brothers and sisters who love Ahl al-Bayt but don't know much about the lives of the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt at all. They know Imam Ali, they may have heard of Imam Hassan Imam Hussain, but if you ask them about Imam al-Kal, Imam al-Radha, Imam al-Jawad and their sayings of wisdom, their supplications, many don't know. Mm -hmm. So I think if we're able to gain that knowledge ourselves and then disseminate the wonderful supplications of the Ahl al-Bayt, the wonderful anecdotes of their life, the wonderful hadiths of the Ahl al-Bayt, um, this is one of the best ways in which we can bring people. If they come towards the love of Ahlul Bayt, they don't have to become Shia. They come towards the love mm -hmm. of Ahlul Bayt and an understanding of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Then after that, it's up to them which direction they take in understanding the seerah of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, and the Quran. Ascent, ascent. I believe we have another caller on the line. Do we have a caller on the line? Assalamu alaikum. Um, Your name and where you're calling from, brother? Um, sorry, it's the. It's the all oh, right. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Um, doctor, maybe uh, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on um, social media and how we can use that for tabligh. And, uh, well, social media, you know, it's like a, a knife. It can cut an orange or kill a human being. If you're going to get on social media to start talking about the Ahlul Bayt, make sure that first and foremost, you know what you're talking about. You know, don't enter... Um, don't enter certain discussions which you don't have knowledge about. Secondly, a person has to try as much as possible to maintain their calm. You may get someone who starts abusing you, making fun of mm -hmm. you, being rude about you, rude about your character. That really just shows how low they are. You have to maintain the upper ground. If they are being rude about you, it shows how much of an effect that you've had. And the Quran gives us a wonderful principle. اِدْعُوا إِلَىٰ سَبِيلِ رَبِّكَ بِالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْمَوْعِضَةِ الْحَسَنَةِ وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِ هِيَ أَحْسَنَةِ Right. Invite towards the way of your Lord with wisdom and a kind word and talk to them in a manner of that which is better. So maintain your calm, spread the hadiths of Ahlul Bayt, one hadith a day. It's not that you go out as a Shia missionary to try and make everybody mm -hmm. Shia. Rather, Ahlul Bayt say, just let the people hear our words. You'll see people flock towards them. I sent, and I hope that's good advice to all the brothers and sisters out there that we can all do a little bit in terms of tabligh and bringing people closer to the Ahlul Bayt. Another question, um, I recognize the number, this is from Pakistan. <laughs> um, my question is about Ma'moon Rashid. Uh, as we know, he was the cousin of Imam Radha. So if he was the first, uh, was he first cousins, uh, why, he, why was he forced, uh, why did he force Imam Radha to join his government? From the very moment that the Abbasids assumed power, People realized that the slogan of giving power back to Ahl al Bayt mm -hmm. was a slogan the Abbasids were using and abusing to get themselves into power. You see, the Abbasids mm -hmm. come from the line of Abbas, the uncle of the Holy Prophet. Yes. Imam al Kadhim, Imam al Radha, come from the line of Abu Talib. Awesome. Abbasids, the sons of Abu Talib, the sons of Abbas, all of these were counted as Ahl al Bayt. Yes. So when the Abbasids overthrew the Umayyads, many people mm -hmm. thought that the overthrowing of the Umayyads would give the Caliphate to who? Bani to the sons Hashim. of Abu Talib. Mm -hmm. Sons of Abu Talib. Abu Talib. But then all of a sudden they saw Safah, they saw Mansur al-Dawaniqi, they saw Al-Hadi al-Abbasi, Mahdi al-Abbasi, Harun al-Rashid. You're right, they are cousins. Mm -hmm. But they barbarically tortured and killed 
the grandsons of Imam Al Hassan and Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. They forgot that there is any Salat al Rahim in Islam. But he knew as well at the time that if he continues with the legacy of Harun and Rashid, people will go against him. So he played a clever political move. Mm -hmm. Look, here's Imam Al Rada next to me. If I had a problem with you, mm -hmm. I'm not going to let Imam yeah. Al Rada come and sit in this comfort. But Imam al-Rada made it clear to him that he knew that this was a scam. Yes. There was no sincerity behind it. That's right. Another question. Um, how did you say the Ma'asuma die? I think you've answered that already. And who are the women buried with her? So maybe the, the, the brothers are asking, um, how did you say the Ma'asuma die? And is there any graves next to her as well or buried alongside her? Well, you have, as I said, that when in the period just before she died, there were 23 members of the family who were killed. Um, at a certain distance from Qom. And then around her grave in Qom, you have the graves of many of the great ulama. Uh, Sayyid, I do believe we have a caller on the line. Sure, go ahead. Inshallah, we will to get through. Salamu alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? Salam. Calling from Germany. Salam. Good dog. Salamu alaikum. Uh, your question for the Sayyid, please. Uh, the question is, uh, what are the benefits of Ziyarat Sayyidah Masumah? Okay, thank you very much for your call. Mm. Assalamu alaikum. Well, the first benefit is naturally that when a person shows the wila, the association with Ahl al-Bayt this in turn brings nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ziyarat Ashura, all the ziyaras of Ahlul Bayt, inni ataqarrabu ila Allah wa ila Rasulih wa ila Amir al-Mu'mineen wa ila Fatima wa ila al-Hassani wa ila al-Hussein bimuwalatikum. That I gain closeness to Allah, to the Prophet, to the Ahlul Bayt generally. Through what? Through my association from, with them. So when I go to visit Sayyidah Ma'asumah, in turn I am getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For every step that I take to visit her, I have my sins being forgiven. By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have the angels asking Allah to forgive my sins and whatever I have. And also at the same time, it's as if <coughs> I'm visiting Imam al Rada alayhi salam. Imagine <laughs> that the moment I step into Sayyidah Ma'suma, that's as if I visited Imam al Rada. Like the hadith says, Man zara al Ma'suma biqum ka man zara ni. Yeah. Um, another question that's come up on the WhatsApp is in regards to taqlid. As in, why should the Shia do taqlid and is it wajib and why? Well, it's rational. Mm -hmm. If you've finished law school, you've been to Qom, you've finished all the legal sciences, you've reached the level of ijtihad, you don't need to do taqlid. But if you're sitting at home right now, watching this television program, chilling, kicking back, having never studied any jurisprudential text, <laughs> you know, it'd be a bit far-fetched for you to think that you can answer all legal questions yourself having not dissected the hundreds of thousands of traditions yes. on these different legal chapters. So it's only rational that a person who's a bachelor or a master's in law is not going to turn around to the dean of the law school and say that I don't need to listen to any of your opinions because I've got a master's in law. <laughs> that person will turn around and say, I'm the dean of the law school with thousands of publications. Yes. Likewise, in Shiaism, if a person himself is a basic student doesn't know the difference between the Arabic grammatical laws, doesn't know the hadith mm -hmm. sciences, doesn't know the jurisprudential sciences, then that person has to imitate that person mm -hmm. who knows the sciences inside out. If, however, the person has mastered all of these sciences, then they don't need to imitate anyone. Ascent. Yeah. Uh, doctor, in terms of further research, if, if uh, the audience would like to get some references, learn more about, say, the Ma'asuma Qum, is there anything that you can actually recommend? Sister Ma'asuma Ja'far had written um, a book um, about the biography of Sayyidah Ma'asuma. Mm -hmm. That's available online, if I'm not mistaken, on elislam.org, okay. al you can find okay. it. Uh, and in Arabic and Farsi, as I mentioned, Sayyid um, Muhammad Baqir Abtahi, 17th volume of the Awalim, uh, he has a whole section mm -hmm. on Sayyidah Ma'asuma and Sayyid. Ali Kupari has a section or has the work Musnad Fatima al Ma'suma, which is available. All of these should be good reads yes. to understand the traditions and the legacy of this great lady. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that inshallah, very near future, we're able to visit Qum, inshallah. sit by her grave, and, um, and reflect on the many lessons and the trials and the tribulations 
that she faced in those 28 years on this earth. Doctor, a final thought to the audience, uh, something that they would like to, what well, you'd like them to take away from tonight's discussion. Well, the main thing, as I said, is let's have many more um, women in our community who are allowed to take up leadership roles, who yeah. are allowed to be of those who lecture, to those who give seminars in different fields, different sciences. Because believe you me, if it wasn't for the Fawatam, beginning with Fatima bint Asad, Fatima bint Zahra, the Fawatam in Karbala, and the later Fawatam daughters of Ahl al Bayt, we would not have the heritage of Ahl al Bayt السلام, with us today. And already many of our women in our community are the most passionate when it comes to learning. Inshallah, very soon we'll have many more who will emulate Inshallah. the knowledge of Sayyidah Ma'asuma. Dr. Sayyidah, thank you very much. Thank you. And to the brothers and sisters at home, Thank you very much for joining us and I do apologise on behalf of Mama Saint TV if there was any technical difficulties and we could not get you onto the show. But inshallah, please join us for another discussion with Dr. Sayyid Amanak Shwani on Live in London. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.